Hi, I'm Levi, host of the true crime podcast, Crime and Scandal. Tune into Crime and Scandal as I dive into the twists and turns of scandalous crime stories. Whether it's an unsolved mystery that keeps you up at night, or a story with riveting courtroom testimony, 911 audio, or interrogation footage, I take you through the case beginning to end. Subscribe to your new true crime audio addiction, Crime and Scandal, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. For more info, go to crimeandscandal.com. That's Crime and Scandal. Reach Freaks. Thank you for listening to Invisible Choir. This episode contains sensitive material, including graphic depictions of sexual assault, which some listeners may find especially distressing or traumatic. Listener discretion is advised. Kentucky police are unable to solve one of the most gruesome murders the small town of Mayfield had ever seen, until an armchair detective left the comfort of her own home and hit the streets to find justice, this time on Invisible Choir. It's said that there is a special spot in hell reserved for the most wicked, evil, and most vile of all human beings. A story like today's will show you exactly why. While most cases of murder are considered to be passionate in nature, providing a quick death for the victim, there are some who will go to extreme lengths in order to torture and inflict an insurmountable amount of pain to those in their grasp. This is one of those cases. In a mystery that brings us back 19 years, we examine how a small town mishandled a gruesome murder investigation, and how one amateur sleuth rose to the occasion in the search for truth and justice. Please be warned, today's episode deals with extremely graphic depictions of sexual assault and violence. She wrote me back and said something along the lines of, I've got information about Jessica's murder. I'm afraid someone's going to kill me. Can you help me? In the small city of Mayfield, Kentucky, tragedy arose. Mayfield is roughly 6.9 square miles. There are 41 churches there, or one for every 243 of its just over 10,000 residents. It's a place where crime is anything but typical, and murder is extremely rare. But on August 1st, 2000, police were called to Mayfield Middle School after someone had found a badly burned, decomposing body behind the school. For some reason, unknown to us or anyone else, the small town's police brass, as it's been described, chose Tim Fortner, a patrolman, to lead his first investigation into this case. Tim's limited experience was obvious early on, as he was quoted as saying, I didn't have a clue what to do next. I had no idea how to organize a crime scene or look for forensic evidence. As Officer Fortner first approached the body, he began retching. He saw as the eyes and tongue bulged from the face, a permanent death mask showing obvious signs the victim had endured an extremely torturous pain. Once his nerves had cooled, he began noticing what evidence surrounded the body. The charred remains of a belt wrapped firmly around the victim's neck and what appeared to be bludgeon marks on the back of the head and a plastic bottle next to the body which had remnants of gasoline inside. The collection of charred remains became a mess, a literal disaster if you will. Once the items had made their way back to the Mayfield Police Station, evidence from other cases mysteriously found their way inside the box from this crime scene, creating a literal mixed bag of evidence from multiple cases. An autopsy concluded that the body discovered was that of 18-year-old Jessica Curran, a new mother to a young son and the daughter of Mayfield's fire chief, Joe Curran. Jessica's death was a devastating blow to the community. Who would want to horrendously torture and kill an innocent woman, let alone the daughter of the fire chief? Right from the start, Chief Curran, Jessica's father, was skeptical about how his daughter's case was being handled. I began having some reservations about it from the very start because the, the lead detective that was put on the case didn't have any experience and he was telling me he did not know what he was doing. Officer Fortner allegedly explained to Joe that he believed he was being railroaded by law enforcement leadership, that maybe they were hoping he would drop the ball and fail the investigation. Well, he was investigating the case, but he was telling uh, my wife and I that He didn't have much experience. He uh, felt like somebody was kind of sabotaging him on the case, going ahead of him before he'd get a chance to talk to people, and that he didn't have much experience and he really needed help. Because of the lack of investigative skills of those handling the crime scene, the case quickly went cold as days turned into weeks and weeks into months. And it wasn't until six months later that Officer Fortner finally had a principal suspect and a direction to take the investigation. Suspicions began to fall on the father of Jessica's child, Jeremy Adams. Jeremy was a white, small-town criminal whom Jessica said had raped her, ultimately resulting in the unexpected birth of their son. But Jeremy had a different version of how the child was conceived, one in which he believed the act was consensual, but stated that he had offended the young woman and that she had changed her story. With this information in tow, investigators went to talk with Jeremy. Around April of 99, I'm saying around April of 99, that we were supposed to have sex, you know what I'm saying? They really added up, you know, what I got from it, as far as the child and stuff like that. but after what happened that night, I, I gave her a kiss on her head. I remember I asked her because I didn't wear no condom. And I didn't 
I ejaculated inside of them. I remember it well. <laughs> but I, I never even knew the girl's last name. All, all I knew was her name was Jessie. You know, she got to do her name was Jessie. <laughs> you know, I asked her if she had AIDS. You know, it kind of hurt her feelings, you know. But, you know, my, when my hormones got in the way at the time, and I wasn't thinking about that no way until after the fact. You know, so I asked her and it kind of hurt her feelings. I said, she said, no, I got nothing. I kissed her on the forehead, I remember. I didn't give her my pager number. She didn't give me her phone number. She, we had no ties whatsoever. So I had a girlfriend. So I said, uh, you know, I'm gonna have to go. We parted. And right after that, I got busted in Paducah for seven grand. The first thing Officer Fortner set out to do was talk with Jeremy, who at the time was conveniently locked up on unrelated charges and willing to talk. He was a man who claimed he didn't have anything to hide. I never seen Jessica Kern, you know what I'm saying? I didn't even know that's who that was. How, how did you know that Jesse, uh, <clears throat> one that you had sex with, find that out, was the same one that, that uh, was okay. killed? Okay, well see, the police had been coming to me, right? I, when, I, when I first seen her picture on the TV, it was a glamour shot. I didn't recognize her in the, in the glamour shot. So I was in Murray at the time, I'm watching my mom's TV, and I'm like, yeah, you know, they just found a body in Mayfield. And I didn't think nothing of it, I, you know, it's kind of shocking, a murder in Mayfield. You know? mm -hmm. uh, I didn't recognize the picture. Anyway, I ended up going back to Mayfield. I get, I get, uh, I get caught by the police, they take me to jail. I'm on the run from Murray, Mayfield, and Paducah. I got charges in all three counties. Mm -hmm. So uh, I go to Mayfield, you know, I get charged. They take me to jail. All of a sudden, this guy, Tim Fortner, he's, and the FBI came in there, they take me in the chapel, and they say, uh, uh, Jeremy Adams, uh, you, you familiar with Jessica Kern? What? They said she was the one that was murdered behind the middle school. I'm like, why are you here talking to me about this? And they said, uh, well, it's, it, it's a rumor on the street that you had a child by her. Well, like I said, I didn't remember her picture from on the TV. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, how can I have a baby by somebody and I don't even know her? During his questioning, Fortner had shown Jeremy pictures of the crime scene, trying to elicit an emotional response from him to guilt him into admitting what police suspected he had done. They was like, well, before she, supposedly before she died, she said that her father's name was Jeremy. I'm like, it still ain't ringing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Did they show you another picture of her then? Later on, when I went to Paducah, mm -hmm. see, I pled guilty to a bail jumping. They gave me seven months time served, so I went on to Paducah to face my trafficking charges. Mm -hmm. I get down there, they start coming on a regular basis. They said, they told me my name kept coming up as the father of this girl's child. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, man, how can I clear my name, man? You know, so y'all leave me alone. I, I requested one of these. I requested a DNA test. They said they found DNA at the crime scene. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, give me a DNA test. I'm not guilty of nothing. I wasn't involved with this murder. Why mm -hmm. would I kill her? There's no purpose in me killing her or being involved, period. Mm -hmm. So I, I did everything I could to try to clear my name. And then there, so they come get me. I think it's the same day they come and get me to show to take, to take a DNA test, they showed me some, I, I remember, I think it was January 15th, 2001, they showed me some crime scene photos. Um, it had her body, it was outrageous, it was blitzed, you know, it was, you could tell, you could tell who she was and nothing like that, she was burnt to the crisp. While Jeremy had denied any knowledge of the case, he took mental images of what he had been shown back to his cell and relayed the information to his cellmate, Jesse Roberts, who unbeknownst to Jeremy was a police informant. Like, for, for example, like, if you look real close in the picture, her tongue is sticking out of her mouth, you know what I'm saying? Then, real close, you can look down the side of her legs and it looks like something's dripping off her legs. And I'm thinking, you know what I'm saying? I go back to the cell and I tell these guys specific details, you know, about, about these pictures. They turned around on me and said, and use that about me, I tell them that me and Lolo is the suspect in the case. They take that and use that against me and say, I admit to it. Jesse took this information and went to the police with what Jeremy had said regarding the case. But what the man didn't know is that police had shown Jeremy photos of the crime scene and gave him details of what had happened. Yet Officer Fortner and the prosecutor for Graves County believed they had enough evidence to charge Jeremy with murder, tampering with physical evidence, and abuse of a corpse. But there was little evidence holding the case together against Jeremy Adams, and both Officer Tim Fortner and the prosecution were going to find this out the hard way. In 2002, Jeremy went to trial for the murder of Jessica Curran, but quickly, the entire case fell apart. Officer Fortner and the prosecution intentionally withheld 18 pieces of video and audio evidence from the defense team. This enraged the judge, who threatened to jail Fortner for what he had described as, quote, ineptitude. 
The prosecution agreed that they should dismiss the case, as there was no evidence to show that Jeremy was the one behind this savage and grotesque brutal murder. And again, the case went cold. This time, the months turned to years. As time passed, the police moved on, but the community continued struggling with the fact that a murderer remained on the loose, and the rookie patrolman who first took Jessica Curran's murder case on, fumbling the entire investigation until the judge threw the case out in shame, went on to become Mayfield's assistant police chief. As if the ranks weren't thin enough, the department suffered from low morale and a staggering turnover rate of 70%. Fortner himself even resigned just 10 months after starting in the position of assistant chief. Everything was crumbling apart. It didn't seem that the murder of Jessica Curran would ever be solved. But in 2004, a recently divorced housewife, Susan Galbraith, took a look into the murder. With her own life having recently fallen apart, she took great interest in trying to help someone else, someone she hadn't even met. Susan created a MySpace page called Justice for Jessica and began her own investigation. I immediately started asking questions. I mean, immediately. I wanted to know what's being said in the street. I could not stop thinking about her. With her hard work beginning to pay off, leads began rolling in through her MySpace page. Convinced she was on the right track, she sent an email to Tom Mangold, a senior reporter at the BBC, and asked him for help. Surprisingly, Mangold responded to Galbraith's request and flew to Kentucky in order to give aid to the search. Both of them gathered all the information they could and hit the ground running with their own street-level investigation, moving through trailer parks and suburbs, interviewing potential witnesses along the way. Not long thereafter, a name began routinely coming up in discussions they were having with local residents. And that name was Quincy Cross. There were many people who had given police Quincy's name before and claimed that he had admitted to the murder. But again, those claims weren't taken seriously because the suspect of the day was Jeremy Adams. Quincy Cross is the one who admitted to me that, that he was in, that he had killed her. Mm -hmm. How come he said he killed her? He didn't give me a reason why he no. killed her. You know? uh, uh, what did, when, when did this happen? When did he say this? What day? Yeah, do you remember what? I don't know what day. I now remember it was either February or March of this year. This year, though. Uh -huh. Then I talked to him. What did he tell you? A host. I remember, see, when I, we ended up getting into a fight that night over my girl that I'm with now. You know what I'm saying? Because while I'm in the penitentiary, he had tried to kiss her on the neck. You know what I'm saying? And I know at this time that he's a suspect in this case. So I'm thinking, if he's got anything to do with it, then he's around my kids, my other kids, mama, then... I'm furious, you know, I'm, man, get away from her, you know. Then he tried to kiss her on the neck. See, her, his girlfriend, Tamara Caldwell, was my girlfriend's best friend. And they was always around each other, and he tried to kiss her on the neck. So when I got out of the pen, his name kept coming up. The primary suspect at the time, Jeremy Adams, shared with police himself that even he had heard Quincy Cross had admitted to the killing. But that was the word of the street, and police weren't taking it. Eventually, Susan Galbraith talked to Jeremy herself about what he had been told. She thought maybe the police would listen to what she had to say in regards to the information Jeremy provided her and Tom, but they weren't having it. No matter the level of detail, Jeremy remained suspect number one in their eyes. We go outside, you know what I'm saying, and we just start trading war stories. We start, see, we start talking about the GD Nation, the Gangster Disciples and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? The number one code, the rule in the Gangster Disciples is silence. You know, and silence is about anything that goes inside of that nation or that organization, silence. If you shall not get outside that nation, if he gets outside that nation, then there's repercussions as far as death or a violation. A violation can be anything. You know what I'm saying? Get, get beat up or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Um, like I said, we was trading more stories. We was out there just talking, kicking it. The whole time I'm shoving beer and Canadian mess in it. But I'm drinking myself too. But I'm not like him. And I would ask him something like, uh, I would say again, I said, man, I, I care less. You know, it's none of my business. You know what I'm saying? I kept throwing little hints at it. And I said, one, I said at one point, I said, uh, to throw him all the way off and give him full assurance that he could trust me with information like that and that I didn't really have no concern for her. Truly, I did, but I didn't want him to know that. Mm -hmm. I would say, man, uh, y'all just murked the bitch. Y'all did what you had to do. I said, murked means murder in a slang word in street form. He was like, man, we had to, we had to. When both Susan and Tom brought this information to the police, they weren't taken seriously, and the potentially vital information that could help break the case wide open was once again ignored. With no story and no additional information, reporter Tom Mangle departed back to London. But Susan was still very determined. She wasn't going to let police stop her from seeking justice for Jessica. 
Later on, in a strange turn of events, Susan observed Quincy Cross on two separate occasions, stalking her directly outside of her home. Though Mangold had already left the country, he encouraged her to contact the state police, as the local force had already firmly proven their incompetence on the case. Susan insisted on confronting Cross herself, and though state police initially declined the idea, they eventually agreed to outfit her with a covert listening device on the premise she and Mangold were working on a book about Jessica Curran's murder. A few weeks later, Cross agreed to meet with Susan at a cousin's house. I kept thinking Cross had, had to be involved somehow. And while Susan Galbraith eventually did speak with Quincy Cross while wearing a police wire, she also spent countless hours digging deeply into the many public records she had retrieved from Mayfield Police. In one witness statement, she revealed that the host of a drug-fueled party that Quincy had attended on the evening of Jessica's murder had actually confided to police that he was acting, quote, bizarrely, and that he kept publicly proclaiming that he, quote, wanted to go find some women, and that he was wired and never stopped talking. The host also indicated to police that Cross had been wearing a black braided belt while at the party, and at one point, borrowed the host's car to go find some women. In her rigorous attention to detail, Galbraith cross-referenced the report with another, more damning one from the early morning hours the following day Jessica's body was actually discovered. A sheriff's deputy reported coming upon a man stalled alongside the road, who was driving a gold Pontiac Grand Prix, a Grand Prix that belonged to the host of the party, the same host who admitted loaning this particular vehicle to Quincy Cross to, quote, go find women. But the report indicated the man likely gave police a false name and identifying information during the stop. But the deputy did take note of something else, something peculiar. The man smelled of gasoline, and in the back seat of the car was a red gasoline container. The deputy also noted the man's pants were nearly falling off because he wasn't wearing a belt. The belt that by then was likely tightly wrapped around Jessica's neck as her body lay burning behind the middle school. Though Galbraith's eventual wired interview with Cross revealed few new details, he did seem intent on finding out one thing, whether or not police had discovered any DNA evidence on the small gasoline bottle located next to where Jessica's body was discovered, a detail that, as far as Susan Galbraith could ascertain, had never been revealed to the public. Cross also revealed that he knew what type of belt was found wrapped around Curran's neck, pointing to a black braided style belt on his own waist during their interview. Yet another detail police had never publicly revealed during their investigation. With no direct confession, Susan walked away feeling somewhat defeated yet hopeful. Though all she and Mangold had uncovered by this point was purely circumstantial evidence painting Cross as the likely culprit, it wasn't until nearly two years later in 2007, after their investigation had stalled out, that Susan had received a new tip, this time on a newly created Jessica Curran Memorial website. The tip was from an alleged witness to the murder, and read, I will help the police as much as I can, but I really don't know who to trust. I'm afraid someone might kill me if I testify to things about this. Can you help me? The details this young woman wanted to share would eventually break the case wide open for police. I was afraid, you know, not only because I was afraid of the guy who actually committed the murder, but also of the police. She wrote me back and said something along the lines of, I've got information about Jessica's murder, and I'm afraid someone's going to kill me. Can you help me? Well, needless to say, I mean, the hairs were standing on my end. This time, a new detective was on the case. Bob O'Neill with the Kentucky Bureau of Investigation had been assigned Jessica's case after her father, the now former fire chief Joseph Curran, petitioned the attorney general for reassignment of the investigation. O'Neill flew out to California to meet with Caldwell and quickly drew her confession. She claimed that she was there the night of the party when Jessica Curran was viciously murdered, and the details of her tragic death were even more gruesome than the original crime scene suggested. Victoria claimed that she, her cousin Tamara, Venetia Stubblefield, Jeffrey Burton, and Quincy Cross were all planning on having a get-together the evening of July 30th, 2000. While they were out driving, Quincy saw Jessica walking back home to her apartment. He pulled over and began to grope the young woman. When she fought back, already a self-proclaimed survivor of sexual assault, Victoria claimed that Quincy came back to the car, pulled out a baseball bat, and hit Jessica a few times, rendering her unconscious. According to Victoria, they all went back to the apartment in which they were supposed to be partying at, and that's when things allegedly took a disgusting, heart-wrenching turn. One right after the other, Quincy Cross and Jeffrey Burton raped Jessica on a bed in one of the rooms. Allegedly, Victoria walked in as the two were sexually assaulting Curran and overheard her mumbling repeatedly in a semi-conscious state, Zion, Zion, Zion. It was the name of her young son. How do you know she was from that or something? Because she kept saying, Zion. Did you know who Jessica's sport? Did you know she had a child? I knew she had a child. Did you know what his name was? Yes. Did you see him? Yeah, most of us did. What was she saying? Yeah. We were going to have a son. And she just kept saying, Zion. Zion. Was she, was she yelling? Crying? Screaming? What was she doing? She was yelling. Was she crying? I don't remember. It 
seems likely that Jessica believed after enduring the horrifying physical and sexual assault that her captors would let her go, that she would return home and hold her young son. But that couldn't have been farther from the truth, because Quincy and Jeffrey were fully intent on finishing what they started, and they didn't plan on leaving any loose ends unchecked or any witnesses alive. Did you go back in the room? You did. All right, now when you went back in the room, can you see yourself going back in? You can see it? You see yourself walking back in there? Yes. Who's in there? Taylor, Quincy, myself, and I think Jeff is the point I can't like really call. Okay. When you go back in there, what's going on? Um, you see? Taylor was holding her legs and she was over. Okay. Where is Tamara when you go back in? She's here. Is she on the bed? No, she's like. Is she going around to the other side now? Um, I just want you to look at it. Where was she holding the leg? Here. On, on her thighs? Yeah. Around her knees? Yeah, right now. Okay. Was, was she kicking her legs? Was she trying to get away? Um, I just want you to hold her. She was holding her legs. Well, did you see her fighting to get away? Was it, why was she holding her legs down? What was she doing? Just holding? That's all she was doing? Yes. Did Jessica have any uh, clothing on? Mm -hmm. No. None? Um, I think she had a shirt on, but I know she didn't have nothing on with the body. After claiming to have witnessed her cousin Tamara holding Jessica's legs up during the assault and not knowing what else to do, Victoria alleges she left the room and came back a short while later, this time witnessing Quincy pulling a bell tightly around Jessica's neck, slowly choking the life out of her and depriving her brain of essential blood and oxygen. The entire time the assault was occurring, Victoria claimed Quincy was quietly taunting Jessica as she frantically struggled to breathe. Is he saying anything to Jessica? I guess she does. Die, bitch, die. Slowly, Jessica would eventually die, but even after her death, the torment of her physical body continued. Victoria pleaded with Quincy and Jeffrey to let her leave, but they wouldn't allow her to. What, if anything, are you saying? No, I don't want to leave. <clears throat> well, how are you saying it? Are you freaking out? Or are you, yeah. Like, are you screaming? Are you... I'm yelling, so I'm going to leave. And there's a no, I'm going to leave. Who said? Who said? Both of them said I'm in it just as much as they are. Well, what are you doing? And what? He's choking. She's catching. You're seeing this. Yes. What else? Is, what else happens? There? What else do you see? Then I think that's when Jeff had came in there and he had he had sex with her. Is she alive? I don't think so. According to Victoria, after Jessica had died, both Jeffrey and Quincy began having sex with her dead corpse. After the men were done, Quincy allegedly told the women there to perform sex acts on and near Jessica's dead body as a way of implicating themselves in the crime so they would be less likely to talk later on. After they finished, Quincy used a wrench to smash in Jessica's head and then stabbed her body multiple times. The group then hid her corpse in a shed for another day before Quincy and Jeffrey took her behind the Mayfield Middle School, doused her with gasoline, and set her on fire. All of the people who had been in the apartment that evening were at one point on Tim Fortner's original suspect list. In fact, Victoria was a known potential witness to Fortner and was placed into protective custody in the home of a fellow female police officer years before. Caldwell told her that she had witnessed the murder and that she feared for her life, and so the officer took her into her home as a way of relieving her fears of retaliation should someone have found out she was talking to police. But for whatever reason, Victoria left that officer's home in the middle of the night and was never seen or heard from again until that fateful day some seven years later when she reached out to Susan Galbraith through her new website. After KBI detective Bob O'Neill secured Victoria's confession, she agreed to testify against Quincy Cross, naming him as the primary suspect behind Jessica's murder. With the confession and all previously gathered evidence in hand, KBI was able to obtain an indictment by grand jury and charged Quincy Cross with the first-degree murder, kidnapping, and rape of Jessica Curran. Quincy's arrest came as a great surprise to his father, who knew his son and claimed that he had never even been to Mayfield prior to the night in question, and didn't even know any of the others who were allegedly also involved. Because of that knowledge, his father refused to believe Quincy was even involved, and that the Mayfield police were guilty of much more than simply fumbling a murder investigation. He believes they were intentionally railroading the case as part of a larger, mysterious cover-up. And though nobody ever wants to believe a loved one may be capable of committing such a terrible crime, there are still more questions than answers. Well, when we begin to deal with facts in the case, then there was no comparison because facts showed that my son had nothing to do with it. Uh, the people that was arrested, 
they didn't even know each other at the time of this murder. So therefore, how can you commit a crime when, there's, when, you, when, you, when the people that's involved don't even know each other? As a matter of fact, he'd never been to Mayfield before. So there's a whole lot that stands out that, that didn't add up in this case whenever we got to dealing with the facts. That night, it's the first time you ever been to Mayfield. That particular night was the first time you ever right. been there. We got to looking at the phone records and things, and I don't know why, uh, but, you know, <coughs> uh, the lawyers he had didn't even look at the phone records to find out where he was. You know, he could prove where he was at the time that the crime was supposed to be committed. During this interview with Quincy's father, David, Jessica's father, Joe, sat right next to him, agreeing with the accused murderer's father that something didn't add up. Two men, one who forever lost his daughter in the most unimaginably horrific of ways, and another who forever lost his son to prison. So things are there that, that could, could, could clear a lot of matters up or, or, or put, put, shed a different light on a lot of things. You're exactly right. But they were intentionally ignored? That's the way I see it. Intentionally? Intentionally. You, Jeff? You feel the same way? Yes, I feel the same way. Intentionally. Come on, there's got to be something else going on here. We can't just have a bunch of people just purposely throwing away all this evidence and whatever because... Uh, well, evidence, like evidence from, from the crime scene disappeared before it got to the police station. It was logged in. There's no physical evidence. Uh, the people that got arrested, there's no physical evidence at all that they was nowhere near uh, Mr. Karen's daughter. Regardless of Quincy's father's doubts and beliefs regarding his son's alleged involvement, Quincy Cross went to trial in April of 2008 and was quickly convicted of all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jeffrey Burton went to trial in September that same year and was found guilty of manslaughter, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Victoria Caldwell and Venetia Stubblefield both took plea deals in regards to their involvement, receiving five and seven years respectively for agreeing to testify against the others in the group. But for Tamara, Victoria's cousin, the one who allegedly stood by and held Jessica's legs while both men sexually assaulted her while half unconscious, she was found guilty of manslaughter, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with evidence as well, and received a full 10-year sentence. Tamara served just over five and a half years of her 10-year sentence and joined the other two fathers during the same program, and as she had from day one, claimed she had absolutely no involvement in the case, and still to this day has no idea why her cousin placed her at the crime scene as another willing participant, and the only person she knew of the group was Jeffrey Burton. I served five years, eight months, and five days. It, it, I, don't, I don't understand why I was put in it, really. Many of the families peripherally involved in this tragic case believe police were involved in some sort of major cover-up, that witnesses were possibly intimidated into telling the story that resulted in the eventual arrests. And it doesn't help that nearly all evidence surrounding Jessica's murder was circumstantial, based entirely on the confessions of a few, with no physical evidence available to support the claims. But in the end, there was enough evidence. During Victoria Caldwell's interview with police, she knew precisely what had been placed around Jessica's neck, what damage had been done to her body, and the fact that a sheriff's deputy had encountered Quincy the morning Jessica's body was discovered, smelling of gasoline and missing his belt. But in another strange turn of events, two additional individuals were indicted on charges of tampering with evidence. On July 5th, 2008, 22-year-old Isaac Benjamin and 27-year-old Lynn Austin Leach were identified as the ones actually responsible for burning Jessica's body behind the Mayfield Middle School. In a case that has continually evolved over the years, we may never know what actually happened the night Jessica Curran was murdered. For all of her hard work and determination, Susan Galbraith was awarded the first ever Kentucky Citizen Award, something she had claimed was the proudest moment of her life. Over the years, both her and Tom Mangold from the BBC kept in contact and remained good friends. Unfortunately, on August 17th of 2018, at the age of 58, Susan passed away. She lived her life to help others and did everything she could for a young, innocent, single mother whom she had never met, utilizing her own pain and divorce to help those who were searching for truth and justice in the midst of their own. And though the families continue struggling with the details and the outcome, the armchair detective and the investigative reporter who flew in on a hunch from overseas helped to bring closure to an absolutely horrendous murder and ultimately helped to find justice for Jessica. Well, that does it for our episode this week. Remember to check out Invisible Choir Premium on Patreon if you want instant access to more than 20 premium episodes and other bonus content. The link is in the show notes. 
We still have a few $15 confidential informant support tier memberships available, and those who sign up by October 31st will receive a limited edition Invisible Choir enamel pin. Once they're gone, they're gone. Thanks for supporting, and thanks for listening, and thank you to our sources. We use a variety of local and national news sources to produce and put together this show. Check out the extended list of sources in our show notes, or go to InvisibleChoir.com to learn more today.